Hi, I'm Joe McGrain. I'm a public artist here in Fort Collins. Um, I've done a couple of art pieces around town. This one is a piece located on what's called the Water Cycle Wall out here at Spring Creek, west of Drake. Some Pooter students and an, an artist, Janet Austin, worked together to build a tile mosaic along this wall that uh, illustrated some of the forms that water takes as it, as it travels from the mountains to the plains. My idea was to create this scale model of the watershed itself. Really tactile, really fun to touch. So I, I, I call it the blue tongue, actually. And, uh, and the title is called Water Washes the Earth. So this is a marker along the trail. And the idea is that it draws you, it, it, it marks the entrance to the art piece and is the beginning of this sequence. We tried to unify this, this as an interpretive space, sort of this dry to wet. I have included this little nod to Horseshoe's Rock here just to orient you to the Spring Creek watershed. I, I sculpted a lot of sort of sub watersheds on this where each little basin is defined by a little stainless steel dam and within that dam is a little, is a little groove cut in. So the, the principle is, is when it rains, um, water would soak in, but in this, in this area, uh, a lot of that hard surface causes the water to run off. Now, uh, without these little check dams, it would run immediately into the creek. What the utilities department has done is they create these things called detention ponds where the water is sort of staggered behind this pond before it drains into the creek and it keeps the water in the ground on the landscape longer. So when you press that button, it fills this up. It's like a shower, like the rain hits the drainage and then you turn off the button and the water slowly drains through these little grooves I've cut. I've also included here these, these little stainless icons here and those are sort of a nod to sort of non-point source contaminants. So there's leaf and yard waste, your house itself, trash that gets blown into the system. Um, pets and um, cars, leaky brake fluid spills. And, uh, and those are elements that we um, as, as neighbors can, can address. This piece is one of, of many interpretive art pieces um, that the City of Fort Collins has commissioned. It was a, a pleasure working on this, so thanks for the opportunity. I hope I can speak loud enough. I, I've lectured in two other classes today, so. But I just wanted to point out, uh, especially since we had that very interesting uh, talk uh, earlier, and he mentioned Spring Creek, uh, but one thing I want to point out, you know, the streams that we have now in the urban aspect of Fort Collins, including the Poudre River, is nothing like they were before the white Europeans came. And, you know, already by the 18, uh, late 1850s, 60s, and especially by the early 70s, irrigated agriculture was extremely well developed. And most of these streams became part of really irrigation ditch networks. And it's always kind of humorous to me when they say we're going to return it to its natural state uh, when, uh, for three reasons. One, we never really knew what the natural states were because the change happened so quickly uh, before anybody really did any, you know, sampling of when we talked these insects. And one thing I want to point out, I hate to use the word bugs because, you know, somebody can bug you, you have a bug in your computer, you're sick with a bug. And uh, so I like to say insects and their relatives, so uh, please bear with me. And uh, so I just wanted to point out very quickly, and there's some great work. Uh, I'm just going to repeat some of this work uh, very briefly here at the beginning. But if some of you are interested, uh, there's been some fantastic uh, papers and books written on perhaps what these systems used to be like. And as was aptly mentioned several times, you know, Spring Creek is really a storm water uh, a system now, and no longer really a creek or a stream. You know, the, like I mentioned uh, before I want to get into the insects, the, the big problem is that we really don't know what these streams were like in terms of their physical appearance, uh, their biota, what were the insects and their relatives in these streams. And one of the big problems, usually in a lot of areas of the United States, there's at least a, what we call a reference stream where you can go back and kind of see what it, the other stream should be or could have been. 
but many of you realize that there are no reference streams from Wyoming to the New Mexico border. Uh, all along the Front Range, all these streams have been uh, completely changed. And perhaps the most, uh, probably untouched, is probably the Little Thompson River, at least before it gets to I-25. But even now, that's changing a lot with the development uh, in the lower reaches, you know, Berthoud and uh, westward. So again, uh, now they're all components of irrigation ditch networks. And I always want to point this out because some people think, you know, you're walking hand in hand with your loved one and you see these beautiful mayfly swarms and this gorgeous landscape and that's how it should be. But uh, that's now, for one reason or another, that's now how, how it ever was or ever will be. And we can talk about that later too. And this is, see, this gentleman's right here. Uh, I just want to, I love his, uh, that he allows me to use this plumbing. Many of you realize that, that all these systems are extremely complex uh, because of all these irrigation ditch network connections, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to describe these systems. And now they're very simplified. Uh, you know, people always ask me, you know, what could occur in the Poudre River or Spring Creek or Fossil Creek? And uh, I tell them, one, I don't really know what was there in the beginning. There's really no colonization sources left for to, you know, some of the native or some of the species to return. And the conditions will never be such that they could even return. It's all about water, and most of you are well aware of that. And especially with systems like that, that's, uh, and that was mentioned, you know, water law, it's uh, beyond the, really the capability of what we can do uh, and ever return or restore these systems to what they were in the past. Uh, but again, no baseline surveys. So the uh, aquatic insects that are there now is probably what was left over uh, already by the 1860s and 70s. A lot of the most sensitive species long have disappeared. We know of some Records, uh, C.P. Gillette was the, one of the, the first entomologists at CSU. He started in the 1870s, and he sent and did some collecting. Uh, can, can you imagine what Spring Creek probably even back then was uh, not a bad stream? You know, it came through the canyon that now is uh, mostly horse tooth reservoir and drained into Fort Collins. And we have correspondence where, you know, sometimes he went to catch a few trout for dinner. Uh, of course, you know, that is long gone. And there were probably some uh, insects. We know the specimens still exist at Harvard University at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. They were sent to uh, experts there in the uh, late 1870s by C.P. Gillette, and none of those taxa exist anywhere in the greater Fort Collins area. There's probably a dozen aquatic insect species, mostly stoneflies and mayflies and caddisflies. Uh, so I wanted to, since some of you are interested in insects, I wanted to cover that. And again, it was real interesting, this previous talk where he was saying, you know, leaves, they rot and nitrify and all that. Well, you know, the bottom line, leaves are actually very important to aquatic insects. In most systems, leaves are the uh, beginning food resource. We call it, kind of call it the peanut butter and cracker story. The leaf is the cracker. It falls, blows, or washes into the stream. It's colonized by bacteria and fungi. And then there's a group of organisms uh, represented by many insect species that we call shredders and it's just like you taking a eating a leaf out of your tossed salad and shredding it between your teeth they um, uh, reduce the larger pieces the smaller pieces ingest them their feeding habits produce smaller pieces plus their feces and then they form a pool of smaller uh, organic material all originally draw, uh, dry from mostly leaves into what we call uh, fine particulate organic material which collector filters then use. And these are aquatic insects that have specialized mouth parts to strain those particles out of the water column. Uh, much like, uh, a lot of them have mouth parts, much like, uh, you know, I always tell my students, you know, how many of you actually vacuum your carpet in your apartment? And they say, well, maybe once a month. Uh, you know, that little, uh, and they sometimes I have to explain it several times, that cylinder that rotates at the bottom of the vacuum cleaner <laughs> with those stiff brush, you know, those stiff uh, brushes there, and they, that removes the particles out of your pile, your carpet. Very similar. A lot of those organic material 
falls to the bottom of the stream. You know, Marcy can tell you, a lot of you wade in the stream and notice the water gets cloudy, some of that sediment, but a lot of that's also organic material resuspended, and that's then either taken out of the water column or removed from the bottom. So that's a very important group. And then uh, there's a few that are scrapers. How many of you ever walked in a stream, like the Pooter's a great example, uh, especially in the canyon, and you start slipping and sliding? That's because the algae that's growing in the rocks, maybe some actinomycetes and water molds, a lot of the algae are diatoms that have silica skeletons, and that's why the rocks are slippery. And these aquatic insects then have mouth parts a lot, lot like a paint scraper. And they scrape that material just like you'd scrape a pan and get that, I like to do always that, get those eggs, you know, that stuff that's left on the pan, and eat that. And that's what they do. And of course, there's a few predators that, of course, take advantage of all the other, what we call feeding gills or trophic levels. And there's a few piercer herbivores. They have specialized mouth parts that can actually pierce plant cells and suck out the contents like you would a Coke or milkshake using a straw. So the big picture is this, and that's why uh, I always like to show this in all the streams in, this, in Fort Collins. Uh, the Poudre River from the canyon mouth maybe to Lyons Park, it's still not bad, but uh, especially Fossil Creek, uh, Spring Creek, others, this type of cycling has been totally disrupted by the current uh, management of these streams. So again, it shows the leaves falling in. They're colonized, taking care of the shredders, and then the smaller particles form that food resource for the collector uh, gatherers, collector filterers, and then uh, you know some of the algae that's growing in the rocks are taking care of the grazers, just like a cow would on a field. So this big picture can then be, uh, and you don't need to see this, but I just wanted to point this out that the communities of aquatic insects can be very much you know, predicted by the food source that's uh, the most prevalent in the system. So generally in more headwater streams where there's a lot of canopy cover, you have a lot more shredders, and as the canopy opens, uh, you, know, you have more of these collector filters and collector gatherers. And if you would look at, for example, the community structure of uh, Spring Creek, you would find that majority of the taxa, and I, another thing I wanted to mention, you know, they're not all aquatic insects. If any of you've uh, collected in Spring Creek, even the Poudre River, there's a lot of crustaceans, uh, different types from amphipods, we call scuds, or some of the aquatic sow bugs. How many of you have seen the planaria? Very common, Dugesia. Uh, there's one species in all these streams here. Uh, lots of little fingernail clams. There's even some leeches, so uh, aquatic worms, uh, etc. So not just insects. There's lots of other invertebrates that I want to point out that you can't forget. And they're all important. And a lot of those are even more resilient and resistant to perturbations, to pollution, to water uh, problem, water quality problems in the aquatic insects. And so just wanted to point out this doesn't exist really in any of these urban streams anymore. And so what you have now is generally a community that only would not exist if there was no water. Uh, that's how tough they are. So I just wanted to cover that, hit that. I just wanted to show you a grazer here. Uh, this is from Bob Zulik gave me this. And this is a case-making caddis fly, and I want you just to see them. There'll be a close-up here, underwater. Oop, that one just left. And this close-up, and this is considered a grazer. And watch their mouth parts right here. They're feeding on this just like a cow would, or some of you, how many of you have been accused of being a grazer? <laughs> and so, uh, so that's a grazer. And so now I want to just go over the aquatic insect orders. And, you know, usually this takes a whole semester. So I'm going to make this kind of, uh, you know, kind of squeeze it down and, and what do I have? You know, half an hour. Okay. So these are the major groups and you saw some of the beautiful images that were uh, submitted and chosen, like mayflies, aquatic beetles, etc. And of course, uh, at the end of this talk, you're going to have to um, actually uh, write all these down and spell them correctly for me, but you don't need to do this. But the, you know, the... The major groups, I'll mention them, are the mayflies, usually the odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies uh, in Colorado, 
are mostly standing water species. So, like for example, there's very few, in, in fact, there's only really one dragonfly you find in running waters down in, in this elevation. Uh, most of them are all associated with standing water habitats. Uh, so that's a group that's really not what we call low tick or running water. And then the stoneflies, they've been all extirpated. There are no stoneflies in the urban area of Fort Collins anymore other than the Poudre River. Uh, when I first came here, uh, and I sh uh, there was, um, they were in Fossil Creek, but when they built that new development plus that golf course, there was huge epizootic siltation events that totally eliminated the stoneflies and a lot of other aquatic insects uh, downstream. And then the true bugs are uh, mostly a terrestrial group, but there's, you know, some of you know them as uh, back swimmers, water boatmen, giant water, water bugs. How many of you seen water striders? You know, again, you know, these are common, uh, but they're really not a major part of the insect community other than maybe water boatmen. And then we don't have Megaloptra uh, around here. You can find an alder fly up the Poudre Canyon. We do, how many of you from the eastern United States have heard of Helgramites? Uh, this is a well-known, people use them for fishing for black basses. We do have Helgramites in Colorado, but not in mountain streams. They're only on uh, eastern Colorado and the Purgatory River, and then, then their Colorado River from uh, Palisade to the Utah border, and then also Lower Green, Yampa, and the Dolores and the San Juan. But they're here in Colorado, but not along the Front Range. Caddisflies is a very important group. Uh, we have one uh, caddisfly species that can be extremely abundant in these urban streams. Um, it's a net spinning caddisfly, and I'll show you some of that. And of course, beetles, a lot of beetles. They're because beetles, as adults, can fly, enter the water, and leave the water. So they're a lot more. They can colonize a lot more, and they're more resilient because things don't get right. They can leave while the other groups are stuck. And then, of course, flies, uh, they're the most um, probably resilient and, and uh, tough of all aquatic insects. How many of you walked along the uh, Poudre River, or any of these trails, and gone through a swarm of non-biting midges? We call the carinomids. Sometimes the larvae are called bloodworms, a couple of genera. You know, well-known group, uh, and some like black flies can be real common even in Spring Creek. Some of you have maybe seen crane flies, et cetera. And then we even have a few aquatic uh, lepidoptera, aquatic moths. They actually are pretty common in the Poudre River. So I just wanted to point out that uh, the fauna that we have probably at one time was a real complex mixture of mountain species that could uh, last as long as those conditions existed. And, you know, we have an expert here that can tell you about the hydrology, you know, the snow melt hydrology that used to control all these systems. And now because of the uh, water uh, storage, the diversions, we've armored mostly the bottoms of these streams because we've prevented these uh, large flushing flows. And we've t totally changed the, the systems because everything from rip wrapping to uh, uh, you know, making these streams really most canals now or kind of conduits to carry waterway that was so aptly pointed out in the first talk. And uh, see, I, there's your name again. Uh, these are what we call working streams. And they're, you know, the best what you can do under the conditions that are present. And that totally depends on available habitat, water, quantity, and quality. And all the aquatic insects we have now left in these urban systems in Fort Collins, uh, you know, adjust to this constant change that occurs. And some of you have been here, you know, every year is different. You know, every spring is different. Just think of last year, we had 300% above normal snowpack, and now it's just barely reached 100% in some of the basins. So we're going to have a different, unless, you know, March really uh, is very different. Uh, we're going to have a very different water year than we had last year or the year before. And so looking at the historic records and what was previously available and our best guess, we think there's probably 150 possible species of aquatic invertebrates in the Fort Collins area. And that includes the Poudre River through Fort Collins. And when you think if you go to the southern Appalachians or the Pacific Northwest, you know, that wouldn't even be half. Uh, it'd be triple or at least double that number. So we have a very depauperate fauna, and that might be in part reality, 
and also in part that you know a lot of the sensitive tax of along disappeared and uh, we estimate there's probably been about a 50 percent loss of the of the aquatic invertebrate assemblages that once occurred in these streams and uh, it'll never get better uh, it could be probably better stabilized and I won't get into all the politics of that and the different projects that have been proposed but there could be even worse conditions in the future and uh, so again uh, if you probably look at all the potential species that may have occurred along the this uh, high plains foothills interface the loss could be even as high as 65 percent so it's very high so just some of the work we've done in some of the what we call the EPT, the mayflies and Fimeroptera, the stoneflies, Plecoptera, the caddisflies, the Trichoptera, these are kind of the estimated losses of, of species that were probably once here before irrigated agriculture. And then subsequent development, uh, everything from you know gravel mining to logging, uh, urbanization, et cetera. Uh, so you can see that there's been uh, uh, large losses, and I won't dwell on those. Uh, and, you know, like this is a nice winter stonefly. This is Capnura wanica, a really sweet species that's coming out right now. And it used to be probably an extremely abundant winter stonefly in Spring Creek, Fossil Creek, Box Elder Creek, uh, but it's totally been extirpated. It no longer occurs. You have to go up uh, Poudre Canyon. You can still see it in Elkhorn Creek and sometimes in Young's Gulch, which are the closest places. Uh, but it's, you know, more or less gone now. And I just wanted to show you, this is uh, Fossil Creek, uh, you know, doing the development of that golf course and that big housing area near the headwaters. They put this uh, dry creek, which I've sampled many times, underground. Well, you think the most of, a lot of headwaters of Fossil Creek is under that shopping center there at the corner of uh, College and uh, uh, Harmony. And so these are some of the taxa, and you don't have to worry about scientific name, I get all excited. But uh, these are probably taxa that once occurred in these urban streams that we know for sure, because there's actually physical specimens, uh, mostly at Harvard, some at the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, too, uh, that were once collected, at least here in the late 1800s in Fort Collins. And they have the label, C.P. Gillette's label, Fort Collins, Colorado. And they have not been uh, seen you know, probably since the early 1900s. So really quickly over the groups, I want to roll here. Uh, I still have some time. Uh, all of you have to learn these, you know, since some of you drew them. Uh, mayflies, you know, the immatures, and uh, Marcy knows all this by heart. They're very easy. Uh, you know, all you have to know is one, two, three, and you can see this with your naked eye, at least I used to, I guess. Uh, one <laughs> claw, and they always either have two or three tails. And if you pick up a rock in, in, the, in the stream or, uh, you know, Spring Creek has still a few mayflies, and even in, uh, uh, especially the Poudre River, and you see a organism kind of hugging the rocks or moving as the water pours off, and then they have tails, as shown here, and there's three of them, you know you have a mayfly. If there's two of them, you have to look at the claws, because stoneflies also have tails. They have two tails, but they also have two claws. Mayfly only has one claw at the end of each leg. And so they may or may not have these gill plates. Uh, sometimes they're very uh, conspicuous, but sometimes like the nice ephemerella that was drawn, those plates are dorsal and you don't really see them until you look under a microscope. And of course, the mayfly adult is magnificent. I don't know how many of you have seen mayfly adults. A lot of the identifications are based on, species identifications are based on the males. This is a beautiful amletus that occurs in the Poudre River. Uh, the male, it's the only order of insects that molts again as a winged adult. And the fly fishermen know them as the dun and the spinner. And this is a spinner. The wings are clear. Uh, the first wing stage, usually the wings are opaque or clouded. And, you know, we have mayflies here in Colorado that live for less than an hour as an adult, to some of them live up to two to three days, sometimes even four days, depending on air temperatures. And we have mayfly adults that have vestigial legs as adults, uh, that they can never land, that they come off the water from their last nymphal skin, and they mate. Uh, the female uh, will not molt, but the male actually molt in the air, 
and then they mate, and then the life cycle's over, usually less than 35 minutes. So there's the old joke, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, uh, unless you want a lot of action, don't come back as a mayfly, because, you know, <laughs> as an adult, because you won't live too long. But this is the special, this is the typical life cycle of a mayfly, and this shows a nice nuptial flights through one of the several insect groups where the males form the nuptial flights. You ladies all know males are totally, uh, you know, we're not worth very much in the long run. So the, uh, the males form the flights, so if there's, you know, aerial predators, uh, they uh, are often satiated with the males. The females fly, usually singular, into the swarm. There are some exceptions, like some of you are fly fishermen know the trichos. Those, uh, those both males and females swarm at the same time. And even the mayfly eggs are awesome. Uh, they have little uh, knob turning and coil threads. Most of them are some gelatinous cover. As soon as the water hits, uh, these little, uh, the, the, see the tips? They're like coil ropes. You know, see how they, as soon as they hit, they, they go out, and whatever they bump against, they stick to. So eggs never really f move downstream very far with the discharge. So this is really neat. So there's a lot of adaptations to you know, the uh, flowing water conditions. And I just wanted to cover the common families you would get in, in urban streams here in Colorado. The big one are the beaded's, and they're called menno-like mayflies because their bodies are very menno-like, torpedo-like. They're swimmers, sometimes clingers, and they all have these nice gill plates on the, uh, at least most of these segments, one to seven. You can see them on the side, and all that is is just extra surface area for the oxygen to diffuse into the body wall. That's how uh, you know, most aquatic insects get their oxygen. Even if they have uh, structures called gills, they're not truly gills, they're more osmobranchs. They're used for the water salt balance. And so this is a well-known group. We have one common species, Betus tricaudatus, and that one species is found from northern Florida to Atlantic Canada to Alaska to Baja California. It's, at least that's how it's being currently recognized. Maybe with molecular techniques, they'll find out that it's uh, more than one species. So this is a common one, and they're very, uh, these are, uh, are amazing on what uh, water conditions they can uh, take. I mean, even polluted systems, they seem to exist, at least in some numbers. And they're uh, usually collector gatherers. They feed like the vacuum cleaner, but sometimes they also can scrape algae off the rocks. This is the famous little stout crawlers. I tried to put common names. This is the famous trichos. They only have one pair of these triangular gills on the second abdominal segment. This is a very common mayfly in Spring Creek, in Fossil Creek. Uh, this is one that's famous trichos. We only have one species in Colorado and on, the west, on the eastern side called uh, Trichrystides explicatus. Again, a widespread species. It's found from eastern North America all the way into California. And uh, they may have, uh, just like beat us, one or two generations a summer, meaning that they can go from egg to adult probably twice during the summer. These may even go three times, depending on how long the fall is. Lately, we've had some really nice long falls. I remember I teach an insect uh, identification class and require a collection, and I still remember those years we had a severe killing frost you know, in early September. And it was great, no more insects to be collected and later graded. Okay, so, uh, but now, you know, they can collect until Thanksgiving sometimes. So this is a well-known group. They often can, this mayfly can take a lot of siltation. They have special gill covers that cover the more uh, uh, fragile portion of the gills, and they can really survive often uh, areas that have high sediment uh, loads. And I just wanted to show, uh, this is a mayfly here, and uh, this is a beetus, or actually, excuse me, this is an amletus. And I just wanted to show you how they, see how they use their gills? Uh, just, they put them right in the water current so they get the maximum exposure and get as much oxygen as they can. And here you can see them, uh, the one on the left is one of those ephemerellids. And of course, most of you know this. This is why mayflies are probably one of the better known groups of aquatic insects. I never argue with an angler, uh, a fly fisherman, because they probably know more than I do. Uh, they you know, spend more time on a stream than I dreamed I could spend, and sometimes to the chagrin of their loved ones. But they surely know their stream, and 
especially the, the angler that takes it as a, almost like a metaphysical experience, you know, really know the literature and uh, know the names. Uh, so, and tying a fly is, uh, you know, to matching the hatch is something special. Uh, I did want to cover the Odonata, because that's everybody's favorite. You know, it's one of the uh, manhole cover. Uh, Odonata, I wanted to go back. Mayflies, there's, uh, we have 107 species in Colorado, and there's uh, 670 in North America, and about 2,200 in the world. It's not a large group of insects. Odonata, we have about 114 species in Colorado. Uh, locally, maybe 30, 40 species. Um, it's a group that's primarily standing water. There are uh, many more running water species, more in the Midwest than the East. Uh, like uh, last year, I hosted the, uh, International, May, uh, the May, I mean, International Dragonfly meeting here. And they were kind of disappointed, you know, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, compared to South Carolina or North Carolina or some of these places where, you know, you can find 80 species. But we did collect almost two thirds of the known Colorado fauna in July when the meeting was there. And uh, so they're a well-known group. There's two types as adults. You know, we call them a damselfly and a dragonfly. The dragonfly is easily identified because the forewing and hindwing is different shape and size, whereas the damselfly you see here, the wings are almost the same size and shape, and they hold it roof-like over the body, whereas the dragonfly holds it out. And both the dragonflies, damselflies, and mayflies are a really ancient group of insects because they're the only insects that are still extant, existing today, that can't fold their wings over their back, which was a major step in insect evolution. So they're called Paleopterous orders, the old orders. Uh, so, and they, they both share, you know, the bristle-like antennae and having veins, uh, a lot of veins in the wing. And the immatures, uh, Dave Leatherman's picture there of Archelestis grandus, you know, mayfly, I mean, dragonflies and, and damselflies have that remarkable lower lip that can be retractable. Remember the movie uh, Aliens when Sigourney Weaver was against the wall and the mother alien came out and their mouth part went out like this and started snapping? That's how they do it. They grab their prey, drag it underneath where their mandibles chew it up. And they're all voracious predators, both as adults and immatures. And this shows a head-on view of a dragonfly. I like that Pothemus lydia the common uh, white tail that was one of the winners. That's one of our common uh, um, uh, dragonflies here. Dragonflies are a lot like uh, birds. You know, they all have common names. In fact, it was real interesting uh, at the dragonfly meeting were the Sibleys. Some of you know that, the Sibley Bird Guide, which many of you may be used. Both the father and the son was at that meeting because they're all into dragonflies. The president of the American Bird Union, what's the proper name of that organization? Yeah, he was there with his wife, and they're all, you know, and they don't collect with a net. They collect with a digital cameras that, you know, sometimes have lenses that big. And it's a huge uh, enjoyment, you know, uh, identifying dragonflies and damselflies. And, you know, the nymphs are, uh, the immatures are voracious predators. And, you know, the adults are really well known. There's a lot of work needs to be done with immatures. In fact, some of the immatures have not been formally associated with some of the adults. In Colorado, each year we seem to get a new dragonfly. Because remember at one time, the Great Plains used to be a formal barrier to dispersal. But now, because of all the stock tanks, ponds, reservoirs, you know, all of you have flown from Denver to Kansas City, all you see is water when you look out the window, all those. And so a lot of these eastern dragonflies have now successfully dispersed in the last you know, 20 to 30 years. Uh, and so it's amazing. You can find dragonflies in Fort Collins that are typically the same ones you'd find in North Carolina, Florida, it's typical eastern ones. And, you know, Dave Leatherman takes these beautiful pictures. This is one of our common, look, they have all beautiful names, variegated meadowhawk. In any of these uh, ponds, I noticed they're draining them. So even the city of Fort Collins now has lost their water. I noticed that running deer, those are all being drained because of the water now. Is that reason? Somebody can tell me that. I noticed they're all draining. I saw the bald eagles eating all the fish that were there, frozen. Um, so, but you can usually find five different species of meadowhawks. And, you know, the eight-spotted skimmers, very common. Uh, there's the 12-spotted, too, Libellula pucella. And, you know, this is our only dragonfly that lives in running water. This is uh, Ophigonpha severus, the pale snake tail, you know, very nice name. You can see these really commonly sometimes along the Poudre River. Uh, on the, the meadows that are nearby. 
They like to perch in the uh, kind of open areas as adults. Uh, very beautiful uh, dragonflies. If you are in the Ozarks and eastern United States, you can get up to 12 species of that same family, Gomphidae. And then, you know, the spread wing uh, Lestes, uh, another common uh, damselfly here in some of these wetlands uh, that you can find here. And the uh, same with these Inalagma, these bluets. And, you know, dragonflies are the most primitive of all insects in terms of mating. I remember when Dave Leatherman gave this talk, he made, a, he made pretty good fun out of it. But the, uh, most insects, you know, the male genitalia and female genitalia is at the apex of the abdomen. But in the dragonfly, and damselfly, the male genitalia is eventually on the second abdominal segment. And then he curves his abdomen and picks up the sperm from that area. And then the uh, female, uh, I mean, the sperm is actually produced in the rear, and then he deposits it in his genitalia. And then when they, they have this wheel. How many of you have seen this wheel? This is very unique in, only in the order uh, odonata, which means tooth. Some of you have been to an orthodontist. Um, so you can see where the female connects her abdomen with the male second abdominal segment ventrally, and that's where the sperm is transferred. And they even have special structures where the male can scrape out the sperm of another male that was there before. So, and then next, and so sometimes they make sure that they're the last male. They even follow the female back to where she's laying her eggs. And all damselflies, especially in this family, C. agrionidae, they, uh, they endophytically deposit their eggs, they inject their eggs in the plant material where, you know, it's protected from desiccation, predators, parasites. Uh, stonefly, my, my favorite group, Colorado is really boring when it comes to stoneflies. There's only 87 species, like Virginia has over 160. Uh, I did a project on stoneflies in Mount Rainier National Park. There's 91 just on the mountain. So you think Colorado with the Great Plains, the Montane and the uh, region, I mean the uh, valleys, uh, you know, that there's very few, but some of them are, you are familiar with them. But again, two tails, two claws, uh, you can easily separate the nymphs. Uh, very few of you will see adults unless you're an angler. Some of you maybe go fishing with the, uh, try when the salmon fly or the pillow fly, they call it, Terranarsis californica are emerging in, in June to early July, uh, the golden stones. How many of you have seen skins like that on the, the shucks, the fly fishermen call them? on the rocks of the Pooter. That's the famous, one of the golden stones. There's two species in the Pooter, Clasinia sabulosa, and which is also found, a lot of our, some of our stoneflies are what we call whole Arctic. They're both in Europe and North America, and that's a natural distribution. And that's one of the species. We have another one that's in Rocky Mountain National Park, Arxenopteryx compacta, that's originally described in Siberia, but they're naturally occurring, you know, the Beringian type of distribution pattern. But stoneflies are extremely sensitive to any kind of pollution, especially temperature. And 99% uh, of all stoneflies are found in usually higher elevations, mountainous areas. And like, for example, we only have three, maybe four stoneflies that are found east of I-25. And almost half of our species emerges during the winter. Uh, most of our winter, uh, one of our, our stoneflies are in the family Capneidae or Nemuridae, and they emerge right now. They're emerge. How many of you have seen them walking on the snow when you're skiing? Or, uh, very common. And this is Clasinia sabulosa. This is the male of uh, really common in the Poudre River, uh, the big golden stone. He can't fly. The female flies. So the male actually waits for the female nymph to get on the rock to emerge because he has to mate with her right there because after that she flies away and says, ha, 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 you know, you won't ever find me again. And so uh, this is uh, really neat. They drum, you know, a lot of stoneflies uh, communicate with each other. The male taps his abdomen, makes a noise, and the female taps, and that's often how they find each other. And uh, this is David Rees, nice picture of Captain Urawanica, the one that used to be right here in Fort Collins. Uh, you know, too bad we couldn't walk right over here and I could show them to you. Uh, there's a sister species of that one called uh, Captain Ura fibula, that if you ever want to collect it, it's out right now. All you do is drive down I-25 to Trinidad, get off the exit where the McDonald's is, park at the McDonald's parking lot, and walk down to the uh, Purgatory River, and there they are. Uh, and the males are totally wingless, uh, and so are the, and the females have really short wings, very nice stoneflies. And of course, you know, these are some of the uh, patterns. I just wanted to show you the Terranarsis californica, which is shown here, the male. 
And so how many of you have seen the movie River Runs Through It? Remember the stonefly at the end when the two brothers see if you know something about stoneflies? A lot of people thought it was actually a Terranarsis californica, but it was not. It was one of the golden stones, Hesper perla pacifica, a common species in the upper pooter, and once was extremely abundant there in the upper part of Fossil Creek, and now it's totally been extirpated. True bugs, I just wanted to show you that. Um, you know, go on. These are all common things. You know, you've seen the, uh, this is mostly, there's some aquatic representatives of mostly a terrestrial group. You know, you've all heard of stink bugs, the true stink bugs, plant bugs, aphids, you know, leafhoppers, cicadas. That's the, all the order, hemiptera now, uh, which means, you know, half wing. But this order is easily separated from all other insects because their mouth parts are in a beak that either rises from the front of the head, the back of the head, or between the front legs, like an aphid or scale insect. Uh, so these are mostly predators, so, or they feed on plant fluids. Uh, some of them are well known, like I hope none of you had an experience with bed bugs yet, or kissing bugs, you know, the shock disease vector, but the aquatic ones are very nice, and many of these are widespread. The species we have in Colorado occur, you know, through almost throughout in North America. The caddisflies, this is a really well-known group, uh, trichos, meaning hair, wing, uh, this is a, a large group. We have here in Colorado close to 300 species. Uh, there's 1,400 in North America. Uh, so this is a, a very diverse group. It's a, it's a sister group, the closest relatives to the butterflies, moths, and skippers. You know, the butterflies, moths, and skippers remained a terrestrial order, and the caddisflies became an aquatic order. And they both have the ability to spin silk and, as an immature. The, the larvae of caddisflies have the same kind of gland, just like some of you may be wearing a silk shirt or silk tie, silk underwear, who knows. And so because of silk, they can either be free living, they use the silk as an anchor line, just like if you would climb rocks or repel, they tie a piece of silk, glue a piece of silk on a rock and let themselves out so they get to the next rock and cut off that silk. Or they can make these shelters out of silk, you know, make a spin just like a spider. And then, or many of you are familiar with case making. They can glue particles together to form cases of all types of material, or they make these capture nets. And caddisfly adults look like a drab moth, except they lack the scales, which are flattened hairs, like Lepidoptera, and then they lack the proboscis, the coiled galia that uh, Lepidoptera, most Lepidopterans or butterflies, moths, skippers have. And caddisflies, because they have the ability to uh, secrete silk uh, compared to only the diptera, the flies, have been able to uh, colonize and adapt to all types of aquatic systems. So like for example, locally here, we have some really nice caddisflies in some of these retention ponds because there's lots of caddisflies that like cattails in the standing water. And some of them like only fast flowing water, some like slower waters. And it depends if they're, you know, they make these cases. Uh, please uh, make sure you learn how to spell all these family names. <laughs> Remember in all zoology, all families end in I-D-A-E. You should know that. And uh, here's one of the capture nets. And if you get good enough, you can measure them and even tell what genus spun that net. And uh, so, for example, the next one here, uh, this is the common one in Spring Creek, Fossil Creek, Poudre River. This is Comati psyche analis. It's real interesting, you know, the same species now occurs on all the Hawaiian islands because it was actually introduced from Colorado and California at one time in the 1950s, the Lockheed Constellations. They filled up coolers with caddisflies from some of the streams, Clear Creek, uh, Dry Creek, and even the South Platte River there in Denver, flew them to Hawaii to release them in the stream so they can keep the uh, trout stocked there because the trout used to starve to death because, you know, there were no in-stream aquatic insects in Hawaii. Now there are including this one. And so this is very common. This is a net spinning caddis fly, and this is the type of net it makes. So what it does, the net is of course like this, the water goes like that. It captures particles, both plant and animal, and it's just like a giant salad bar. The caddis fly larvae comes out from the retreat and grazes on the net and picks what it likes. You know, it might not like the gambanza beans, but it might go for the red beets instead. So, well-known group, uh, lots of work has been done. We also have another, Hydropsyche oxentalis is very common in the Poudre River. These are, again, very tough, tough uh, insects. They can survive a lot. 
And just wanted to show you, this is a filter feeding. This occurs in the Poudre River, sometimes even in Spring Creek. This is Brachycentris oxenitalis, the famous Mother's Day hatch caddisfly of the uh, Arkansas and Colorado River. And this is a filter feeder. And I just wanted to hold their uh, feet out. They have hairs, and they grab particles. And watch him how he takes his uh, leg and puts it in front of his uh, face. And just like if you had a real bad case of dandruff, I'm not saying you do, and you take a comb, <laughs> And you comb your, you know, the dandruff, the static electricity gets it, and then you lick it. That's how they do it. So that's filter feeding caddisflies. And of course, most of you are familiar with these. You know, how many of you have seen case making caddisflies? A lot of people think that's the only caddisflies out there. Actually, they're a small percentage of all the total caddisflies in, in the world, uh, but they're very conspicuous. And we have some really nice case making ones that still occur even in Spring Creek. You can find uh, Hesper phylax, Occidentalis, even Designata sometimes, especially in the headwaters of Spring Creek. Uh, since somebody showed the beautiful diving beetle, uh, he had Dyticidae, he had the predaceous diving beetle, uh, Dyticus marginicolus, uh, at least that's the one it looks like he had. But these are, you know, again, a, basically a terrestrial group. You know, one out of every five living things is a beetle, and you think there are more beetles than all the vascular plants, algae, and fungi put together. And uh, so some people estimate in Colorado there's maybe 100,000 different living things, and insects probably make up 20,000 or more of that, uh, and beetles probably make up you know, a good percentage of that 20,000. Uh, so a very uh, successful group, uh, but most of you know them as you know, more terrestrial groups, you know, like ladybird beetles, fireflies, you know, these things that uh, you can get romantic about. And uh, beetles are pretty cool. The adults are a piece of cake because they're the only insect group that the front wings are modified in a shell-like structure. Sometimes they're soft. They meet down the middle in a straight line and they lack any kind of veins. Uh, but there's lots of nice aquatic. We have probably in Larimer County over 200 species of aquatic beetles. Uh, and some of them feed on algae, some of them are pred predaceous, some of them are scavengers, etc. And what they do, the adults actually take a bubble of air down with them and you can see that silver or that white, that's a bubble underneath their wing covers where their spiracles, their opening to their tracheal system, the tube-like system that innervates their body that carries oxygen to the tissues and, and different parts of the uh, inside of the beetle. That bubble lasts depending on temperature and partial pressure of nitrogen and oxygen in the water. So sometimes they can stay underwater a great period of time. Apparently the world record is 13 years. I always wonder how they determine that. Somebody is watching it for 13 years, but they even got that published in, in science. And this is our common one. You can find this one in uh, Spring Creek and Poudre River. Uh, this is one of the Elmids, the Riffle Beetles, a very common group. They're, again, a very resilient group. And that group's kind of interesting. They, all beetles uh, pupate, you know, have their pupil stage on the land. And then they'll, like this group, they'll uh, hatch as adults, and they have a short uh, adult life on terrestrially. They mate, and then they enter the water and never leave again, this family. In fact, the wing covers become uh, almost cemented together. They can never uh, actually open their wings again. And they'll live three to four to five years uh, in the streams here locally. And this is, uh, whoever drew that uh, nice beetle, you know, that one that won the, uh, that's the larvae of it right there. That's the immature. Uh, they have these predaceous uh, mandibles, and some of these can actually have been implicated in decline of certain amphibians because, you know, they grab the amphibian and just, in, and then they inject digestive enzymes that extra orally digest their prey and suck it up again like you would a, with a, because the mandibles are hollow or have a tube or a canal that allows the digested liquids to uh, seep back into the, adult, in the larval beetle. And then I just wanted at the very end here, end with everybody's favorite because you do enjoy mosquitoes. Uh, when I first came to Colorado, you know, the mosquitoes were nothing but a nuisance. Now, you know, they're vectors for a disease, all of you know, West Nile, and, you know, other parts of the world, like CDC estimates that, you know, hundreds of millions of people will be exposed to mosquito-borne diseases, especially like malaria, et cetera. And you think, why is the CDC in Fort Collins? It was originally in Greeley because of Western equine encephalitis, mosquito-borne disease, and then also strep throat, but that has nothing to do with insects. But some of these are very common, uh, like the carinomids, the non-biting midges, the black flies. 
And uh, Diptera immatures are piece of cake to identify because they're the only order of aquatic insects that the larvae, the immature stage, have no jointed thoracic legs. So, you know, the maggot looking type of immature. Uh, just usually a developed head capsule, sometimes that's even reduced to mouth hooks. So, uh, a great diverse group and probably the most uh, abundant in the entire Fort Collins area in terms of the aquatic systems because uh, many of these have rapid reproductive cycles. They, the adults are excellent dispersers. They, uh, you know, colonize habitats very quickly as they're formed and often have large uh, numbers of offspring and high densities. And you, all of you have seen the nice swarms of the adult midges. And here's everybody's favorite. Uh, all of you know what makes a mosquito bite itch, I hope, right? The saliva, yeah. You see, you are a genius. You are completely correct. So yeah, you know, a mosquito keeps, uh, keeps the blood from clotting. They inject saliva, and that's what's left when they leave, and your body doesn't like it. So a well-known group, and you know, a lot of the dipterans uh, have the most remarkable of all feeding habits. They, some of them are predators, some are collector filters, collector gatherers. Uh, some of them are uh, parasites. Uh, they cover the entire gambit of what we call the feeding gills, and that's one reason they're really successful. In fact, they're small, they disperse, like I mentioned, they colonize, you know, dipterans are everywhere. And how many of you seen ever the blood midge, one of the only three insect groups that actually have hemoglobin, the respiratory pigment? Uh, the other one, one of them is also an aquatic insect, the back swimmer, but the other one is not the horse bot. Some of you have uh, maybe had gastrophilus, if you have a pet horse, almost uh, a good chance almost every horse has had a bout of uh, you know, what we call gastrophilus intestinalis, the horse spot. So these can actually live in very anoxic conditions. And uh, one of the last slides I wanted, that's the uh, uh, scanning electron micrograph of a black fly uh, uh, larvae. And that's the filtering, the antennae are modified to filter out particles. And you can see that one particle is even captured there. And they just sit in the stream uh, filtering out this fine particular organic matter in the stream. And, you know, we have like five species in Spring Creek. We're really fortunate that they're not really bad biters here. How many have ever been to the northeastern United States or Atlantic Canada where you can hardly stay outside because of the black fly, especially late May, early June? Uh, most of our black flies are ornophilic. They're bird feeders. And uh, so some of them get in ears of horses, et cetera, but they're not biters like even a lot of other areas, southeastern United States, mid-Atlantic states. Very common group of aquatic insects. So here's your test. So uh, all of you know these aquatic insects, right? So uh, I only have a couple more minutes. I wanted to stay on time. I, unlike you, you know, when you get old and ugly, you have to go to bed early. And so um, I always try to be in the, my office at 5.30 just to handle the email. But So in Phimeroptera, you should know the mayflies. The immatures is what you'll be encountering. Uh, but how many of you have ever seen a nice little mayfly on your screen in your house? And uh, sometimes they have that nice uh, color patterns on their wings. How many of you have seen that during the summer, late summer? That's Calebeetus ferruginus hageni. That's a very common pond inhabiting beaded mayfly that occurs in all these settling ponds, all these ponds that are everywhere around Fort Collins. Even in your bird bath, they can do fine water features. If you have, uh, like some people, when I used to go around with the mosquito people looking for uh, Culex habitats, you know, people put these plastic swimming pools in their backyard so their dog has a place to jump in, and sometimes they're even doing well in there. Uh, so, in Phimeroptera, remember one, two, three, one claw, two or three tails. So right away, if you look at a rock, pick it up, and you see these insects that have three tails, it's gonna be a mayfly. And if you find a stonefly, Plecoptera, in Spring Creek, you better let me know about it because that'll be probably headlines in the Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, maybe the only decent headline, never mind. So, uh, so then Odonata, you should know, the dragonflies and downsflies, the immatures have that lower lip that's retractable, uh, very distinctive, and you have the damselflies and the dragonflies. The damselflies have those three gill plates at the uh, tip of their abdomen, while the dragonfly nymph, they have internal gills, they have rectal gills. So I'm sure uh, Marcy does that. If you put a dragonfly nymph in a pan of water, you know, they, they jet. They're like they uh, expel water out of their rear end 
and they use that to propel themselves, actually. Well, dams fly have those three plates. Uh, then stoneflies, two, two, two tails, uh, two uh, claws. And in good years, flow years like this year, uh, I took my class out to Environmental Learning Center, and we were collecting stoneflies, and I thought I was going to have another heart attack or something. But because, you know, we had these high flows, but uh, your colleague can tell you, you know, uh, like one day uh, in November it was like 60 CFX, next day it was less than 6. So with that kind of water management, uh, you know, those stoneflies don't survive. So none of the stoneflies will survive the winter. Uh, generally uh, from, uh, north co from college there, where the Poudre River crosses, all the way down, you know, you won't find any stoneflies left in the spring because the water flow gets too low, and often the, sometimes the freezing or anchor ice can also cause a lot of mortality. Hemiptera, you should know that group. The nice water striders, well-known group, water boatmen. Um, you know, sometimes they even colonize swimming pools, like the back swimmer and the water boatmen. These guys can fly great distances. Uh, you can even find them in desert pools. Uh, they're amazing in their dog bowls. They're just remarkable in their ability to uh, disperse. Don't worry about Megaloptera unless you're going to the east and then, or you go to special places in Colorado. Trichopter, you should know. Uh, I didn't tell you, but they're, you know, that's a group of insects that we call holometabolists, have complete metamorphosis where you have egg, larvae, and then the pupal stage, that remarkable transition stage between the eating machine, the larvae, and the adult dispersing and reproducing machine. And so the caddisflies are real easily identified, and I might go back to that just to show you because you guys need to uh, uh, show a caddisfly here. <coughs> See, they're the only group that, uh, look at their rear end, they have a pair of what we call anal prolegs, each bearing a claw. Uh, see, at the right at the end there, you can see that claw. So they have a well-developed head capsule, and usually this group has actually plates on the pro. So um, they have these nice plates. This family, Hydrocycidae, have these plates. But Caddisfly larvae are real easily identified. They're the only ones you're going to find in the stream that have these two anal prolegs, they call it, these false legs, each bearing a claw or a hook. So they're not, you know, you can identify those very quickly. And then finally, um, coleoptera, you should have no problem. Most of you will never find too many larvae. Uh, and most of these are lentic, you know, standing water habitats. Uh, there's, you know, the adults are often sometimes in the streams, but the larvae are sometimes very uncommon. And of course, the diptera and the immatures, they have no jointed thoracic legs. There's no legs behind the head that are jointed. And I didn't cover the lepidoptera because they're, you know, real, they're common, but they're uncommonly collected. We have the genus Petrophila, a couple species. The adults are beautiful little white moths with uh, gold and silver speckling. But again, most people don't notice those. They emerge late in the, in the summer. So anybody have any questions? If I got your question correctly, you know, what, uh, what are some of the factors that uh, led to their, expert, uh, to their extinction, you might say, or why they're no longer there? Is that your question? Physiological. Oh, physiological. Well, I mean, the bottom line is the simple, and it's a complex answer, but these aquatic insects were adapted to this snow melt peak, you know, flow regime uh, originally, you know, where you had the peak flows, uh, you know, late uh, spring, early summer, and then gradually these flows diminished and you had the lowest flows in the summer and fall. Well, with, you know, diversion, with damming, you know, storage of water, those natural flow regimes were totally altered. And that probably interrupted their life cycles because their life cycles were probably very closely kind of attuned with this hydrological cycle. And once that was interrupted, that probably began their end. But the interruption or the change of the habitat was so immense. You know, you read where the entire Poudre River was dry at times because the water was being diverted directly, especially in the drought years directly into the fields or directly into the irrigation ditch networks. Uh, that was probably the major reason was flow. And so, of course, if you have reduction in flow, then the temperature differences, water chemistry differences, et cetera. So, you know, it becomes pretty complex. Any other questions?
You know, it's surprising. You know, there's 31 orders of insects, and sometimes, you know, after all these years, I've been, I have to sometimes think of some of the really unusual groups, like the Zoraptorans is an order of insects in North America. There's only three species, only one's ever collected, and every time it is, you write a paper on it. So they're called angel insects. So if they forget that one, I'm not too upset about. But, uh, you know, these are not, that's not too much to remember, I don't think, do you think? You know, uh, EPT is a nice one, Infimeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera. And then, you know, people know Diptera because you've had a, uh, you know, experience with a housefly, I hope. Uh, or if you've been outside, you've had a maybe experience with a horsefly, deerfly, with a mosquito for sure. How about noceums or punkies? How many of you have been bit by those? Um, et cetera. You know, so there's, you know, how many of you looked at a dead animal and seen all the maggots, you know, and... Notice that it was the same big fly that was uh, just crawling on your uh, pancakes, you know. <laughs> and so um, they overwinter as adults and often enter homes. Uh, you know, the most common, my mother used to live in Park Lane Towers, and they were always infested with uh, cluster flies, you know, and they're earthworm parasites. It's another uh, polynia. It's another uh, common fly. And your earthworms are probably not native to Colorado. The five species we have were all introduced uh, you know, so etc. Uh, of the species you find, for example, in the pooter, are there any introductions? Are they either native or introduced? Uh, I can't think of um, really one, you know, of the EPT that's introduced. They're all native species. Uh, I mean, we have some dipterans that were probably not native to Colorado, but that's a group that, and, and I mentioned Odonata, you know, they're not European or Eurasian species, but they were probably not here before the white Europeans came, uh, but they've now colonized. Or like, you know, one out of five insects that you see in Fort Collins are non-native, if you want to, but they're all terrestrial, you know, European paper wasp, imported cabbage worm, you know, cabbage butterfly, I mean, on and on, earwig. I mean, all those ones that you commonly see, if you find a flea in your house, it's probably the human flea, uh, so that's introduced. Uh, so, you know, that's... And you think most of the millipedes, centipedes are introduced, most of the roly polies are introduced. Uh, so, but aquatic insects, you know, most of the way aquatic insects disperse is through water connections. And, you know, and uh, the adults of most of these groups, other than the diptera, and probably the coleoptera, maybe hemiptera, which are all widespread, you know, they are, the adults themselves, like infimeroptera and plecoptera, they don't really disperse widely. They, like, there's been research done in Rocky Mountain National Park where uh, even though the drainages are only sometimes a few feet apart, the uh, genetics are very unique among the same species, even though they're recognized still as the same species. They've already accumulated genetic differences because there's no panmixis. You know, there's no mixing of the populations because the adults just don't disperse. No, thank you.